Peace. This is Jamal Robinson with 720astrology.com. Today, I want to talk to you about the upcoming uh, lunar eclipse in Taurus. It's at five degrees of Taurus, and it will be on October 28th uh, at 3.23 p.m. Central Standard Time. Please make the necessary adjustments for the time zone you live in. Starting out, let's talk about uh, the difference between a solar and lunar eclipse. As you know, we had the solar eclipse on October 14th at 21 degrees of Libra. And now we're having the follow-up lunar eclipse at five degrees of Taurus. Solar eclipse is when the sun and moon are at their new moon or we, when we have a new moon, when the sun and moon are at the same degree. And it is expressive. So um, a solar eclipse typically is going to yield its effects faster and um, more overtly. If you think about a lunar eclipse, this is when the sun and moon are in opposition, then it is going to take on more of a lunar nature, more subconscious, more internal, more private, slower developing because it's not something that is outward. So um, with this lunar eclipse, we're looking for prolonged effect of it. Whereas the sun with the solar eclipse is something we see sooner and more overtly. Think about the word eclipse by itself. We're talking about something passing over and this passing over or the eclipse, the covering of something is almost like, uh, you know, the old Hollywood, I can't remember what they call that thing where the guy comes out and says, take two, you know, the, I can't remember the name of that thing, but that's kind of like one way to consider an eclipse. This is, um, something that especially holds true for me with these, uh, the, this set of eclipses we're having, um, right now with the solar eclipse and Libra and the lunar eclipse and Taurus. And I'll touch on that later. Um, but, but back to the lunar eclipse, which is basically a full moon on steroids. I want to talk about um, what that really means. The full moon, those who study astrology know that um, we typically don't want to have any surgical procedures during a full moon um, because the fluids in the body tend to swell or increase or inflame when we have a full moon. And I'm going to read you some, reference some literature here uh, to kind of help explain and support that statement. Um, so typically we, we want to advise clients not to undergo some type of surgical procedure um, when the moon is waxing and definitely not when it's a full moon. Uh, my wife is a pediatric nurse, and she has told me numerous times that the uh, NICU department, um, which is the, uh, basically neonatal, I can't remember the what the acronym means, but it's basically what handles newborn babies, um, that childbirth, mothers coming in delivering, typically skyrockets during a full moon. And if we think about the whole thing about fluids, 
what starts the whole birthing process, the water breaking. So it makes perfect sense. So the full moon is a time of increased tension. And the, the aspect formed between the sun and the moon is tense. It's an opposition. And so the full moon, I don't know if this camera will pick it up. It's like the, there's a, a energetic uptick all over the planet. The surface of the waters all over the planet, which includes us as the inhabitants of the planet. And to that, I'll take a sip. So I want to read from two books. One is from a guy who was a psychiatrist. I don't know if he's still living. Um, Dr. Leonard J. Rabbits. And this book is Electrodynamic Man. I found out about this book by um, perusing the bibliography of uh, one of Stephen Forrest's books because he references this book. And uh, this book is somewhat rare. I mean, you can find it, but it was really expensive a while back. I think you can get it for about 50 bucks right now. But it's called Electrodynamic Man. So this is not coming from an astrologer. And this is definitely, he doesn't appear to be a proponent of astrology, but indirectly he is going to show the validity of astrology. And he really um, is inspired in this book by two guys. Um, one is Burr. Uh, let me see if I can find their names. I should have marked that page. Harold Saxton Burr and Filmer, Filmer Stewart Cacao Northrop. Um, and these were some pioneers um, from a Western perspective in electrodynamism. And basically which is basically saying that man is the result. And I'm, I'm grossly simplifying this, but in essence, my understanding, man is the result of fields of energy interacting that we are the, 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 the outgrowth of and participants in fields of energy. And almost like we are radios. Okay. So I want to read some, a little bit from this book. He is going to, he's referring to one of Burr's, Burr posed these six questions. And one of them was, can the effect of any cosmic forces on living systems be measured? Um, and he writes, an affirmative answer to Burr's sixth question is not only of great scientific and medical importance, but also has potential philosophic and even political significance. For if cosmic forces have a direct effect on the field of the human organism, this means that the human race is subject to the influence of great cyclic forces, which it cannot evade or ignore. In other words, we are not quite as independent as we think, and it would be to our advantage to understand whatever relationship might exist between our health and well-being and nature's cosmic energies, astrology. It is important to understand that if we are enveloped in and influenced by the great organizing fields of the universe, it also means that we are integral are an integral part of that organization. As Burr wrote, quote, the universe in which we find ourselves and from which we cannot be separated is a place of law and order. It is not an accident nor chaos. It is organized and maintained by an electrodynamic field capable of determining the position and movement of all charged particles. Again, this is... Uh, in support of astrology. 
Philosophically, then, man as a part of a highly organized universe is not an accident. We are not, as some still quaintly believe, the haphazard product of molecular copulation and some improbable primeval cosmic consume. Um, if cosmic forces affect the human field, they are likely, as we shall see, to affect not only human health, but also human behavior. Since cosmic forces operate in cycles, it is probable that there are times when the human race is especially subject not only to epidemics of disease, but also to psychologic disturbance and unrest, making civil commotion and war more probable. If this could be established and the cycles plotted, it would have great political significance and usefulness. Do you think that certain <laughs> powers that be use astrology? Okay. All right. Uh, now I want to read something else here quickly. Um, so uh, he's in this section, he's saying the statistical study did something more. He's referring to a study that, that was done um, that he was basically summarizing. A statistical study did something, this statistical study did something more important than demonstrate field intensities and polarities during the phases of the moon and the seasons. It demonstrated the profound field changes which occur around the time the moon is in conjunction, moon interposed between sun and earth, new moon, and opposition, earth interposed between sun and moon full moon near conjunction and opposition provides a more accurate description for such field shifts than exactly at conjunction and opposition for as field maxima frequently occur before and or after the precise lunar day the form of the moon more often appears crescent or gibbous so basically he's saying leading up to the new moon or the which is in our case here, the solar eclipse, after, leading up to and after the solar eclipse, which is the same as a new moon, or leading up to or and after the full moon, which would coincide with the lunar eclipse, we see energetic changes that seem to coincide with these alignments. Now, he's going to try to backtrack here and say now he's not trying to say that the position of the sun and moon. I think he's trying to be very careful to not align himself with astrology, but he does. He is supporting the basic, the, the scientific nature of astrology. Now, I want to go over to another great book. And this is Interpreting the Eclipses by Robert Call Jansky. Okay. I read a couple of things in here where he's kind of provides some more supporting information. Now, of course, he was an astrologer, so he's not beating around the bush, but he has a very scientific way of approaching how he explains astrology. Um, where should we begin? Um, let's start here. I think that the major difference in delineating solar and lunar eclipse phenomena astrologically is that the effect of the solar eclipse is much more overt and obvious. Okay. Which I said earlier, the effect of the lunar eclipse when it accompanies the solar eclipse is far more covert and subtle. The lunar eclipse works much more at the subconscious level. It has been shown that at the time of the full moon and especially during a lunar eclipse, the surface tension of all fluids is increased. The molecular cohesive forces at the surface of any fluid because our bodies consist largely of water. This is this increase in molecular tension is bound to produce a biochemical effect upon our bodies. Furthermore, our bodies tend to take on and hold larger quantities of water during the full moon phase each month. The skull being the only area of the body that cannot readily expand with increased fluid pressure, 
therefore exerts greater pressure upon the brain cells, which ultimately affect our behavior patterns. That's key. This increased fluid pressure in the body also explains why there is greater potential of hemorrhage, fall, which we touched on that already. Okay. Now, uh, so he, that further explains the, the physiological and psychological responses. Um, and there was something else I wanted to to say, add, to read out of here. And I'm trying to remember. Okay, here in this section, he's, here's one interesting passage. The human nervous system consists of nerve fibers connecting various parts of the body together to make it function properly as a whole. These nerve fibers are conductors of tiny electric currents which transmit messages to and from the brain. These currents can be measured using an electroencephalograph and other devices, encephalo brain. Um, the lie detector is another instrument for measuring the electrical nature of the surface of the skin. If current flows from the nerve fibers, then a magnetic field is set up around the body and it may well be that auras do exist and can be seen by persons having unusually acute visual perception of this type of electromagnetic radiation. If eclipses, for example, have such a drastic effect upon the earth's magnetic field, it is illogical to at least suppose that they affect the body's magnetic field proportionally. And if all of the more subtle changes in the Earth's electromagnetic field from moment to moment affect our weather and radio transmissions, it is illogical to suppose that such changes affect the character and operational status of our bodies um, as well. Okay. So... That is kind of just to help set the stage for the how in depth uh, and important and effective eclipses are when it comes to our experience here on this planet. Now, that word eclipse, when we talk about covering, it can bring on this thing of placing endings to things. And when we use that word end and naturally, we, we can, one of the words associated with that is death. But what is death? Uh, I think it's, it's fitting to, I want to find my, my etymology book because I want to discuss that word, death. looking for my etymology book because I want to discuss this word death. And we'll look up the word die as it coincides with death. And I'm using I have another copy of this, but this one is my old one I've had for about oh, almost 10 years and it is torn to shreds, but I love it. I got me a new copy. I just don't want to mess it up. It's the origins of English words. Possibly my favorite book. Now, what we're doing is we're looking up the etymological root of the word etymology, uh, etymological root or etymology refers to the origin. Etymon, the origin, the fire, the DNA of the word. So the way you use this book, you go back here to the back and you look up whatever word uh, you're looking for. Uh, it's cameras. Let me... I should have turned the, either way, it's the words here is highlighted. 
I don't feel like having to focus this thing. So then it'll tell me where to go and find the 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 root up here in the book. So the word die, D-I-E, traces back to three roots. One of them is do, as in D-O. Um, and it means give. Okay. Now, when we look up the word give, let's, let's find the word give back here in the back of this book. Okay, the word give comes from the Indo-European root geb, which is G-H-E-B-H, okay? And the word give, which traces back to geb, the meaning of geb, which is the root, is give and receive. So if we trace this all the way back, let's do it this way, because I want this to make sense. Let's go to the whiteboard. I like doing stuff with the whiteboard. Let's uh let's see if I can get this thing going. Uh there we go. Let's go to the whiteboard. Okay. So what I did was I connected the word eclipse. I associate it with death. Why? Because for some to something to eclipse something, it is going to cover. Okay. And when that that word cover can kind of bring on the feeling of an ending. And that's what an eclipse does. It brings an ending to a previous cycle. Okay. But in bringing an ending, it also is a beginning. So maybe we can say an eclipse also has an energetic signature of the planet Pluto, which is the planet of transformation. But for something to transform, trans means to change or go across or move. So transform, form means to make, excuse my handwriting. We're changing form or changing the way something is made. It's being made into something different. So that also encases the themes of death and life. Hold on. Hands acting up. Death and life. So, hope all this makes sense. We all started with an eclipse, which is a covering. And a covering also means an ending. But because it's covering, and placing an ending to a previous cycle, it also is a beginning of a new cycle. Because it embodies both of those themes, it has an energetic similarity to Pluto, which is the planet of ultimately transformation. And transformation embodies the concepts of death and then life, ending and beginning. So that's why I'm even going down this road of looking up the etymology of the word die, which coincides with the word death. 
Okay. So we'll erase all that. Okay, that's taking too long. So what I did was I looked up the etymology of the word die. It comes from the Indo-European word, root word, do. When you look up the word do, its meaning is give. So what I did was then, what I often do is when I get a, a word defining a word and I want to keep digging and look up the origin of that word. So what's the origin of the word give? It is G H E B H Geb. And the word Geb, the Indo-European root that is, I'm underlining these. These are both Indo-European roots. Okay. It's defined by two words, give and receive. And so I just use my common sense at this point. It is energy going this way, energy going that way. Reciprocity. Reciprocity also basically aligns with the word karma. We receive in equal measures what we give out. So these themes are key right now with this eclipse season. It's an energy of giving and receiving. It's an energy of things ending and things beginning. Now, uh, this aligns with the first law of thermodynamics, which you, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. You've heard it several times. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed. The same energy we start with is always there. The same quantity, the same volume. Um, and I know I'm using wrong words to the, but you know, it, no, it's not wrong because energy can take on all these forms. The way it can be measured in volume and quantity. And, um, but basically, that law is saying that the energy does not increase or decrease as in it, it, it dissipating, but it changes forms. Okay. That's that word again, changing form, transform, transformation. Why is this important? Because we're closing now basically a 19, 20 year chapter in our lives. And this is not just conjecture. I'm sitting here looking at the natal chart for when I started my personal training business. And I, this is what I used. I used the date and the time for when I filed for the DBA um, at the Dallas courthouse. This is the DBA for gym works, April 7th, 2004, 12 or 1 PM Dallas, Texas. So, um, you know what, this is what I'll do. I'll pull this chart up. Let me pull it. I'll pull this chart. Okay. So if you notice here that when, and I wasn't studying astrology 19 years ago, I didn't know anything. So um, 
But when I go back and look, talk about a faded situation in my, let's just look at the money house, the second house, Leo was on the cusp. 10th house, Aries on the cusp. So this was a great um, outlook for the success of this business because the ruler of the money house or the house of resources is exalted, which the sun rules Leo. The sun is exalted in Aries. So there was not only a sign that financially this would be uh, successful, but also there was a chance for prominence because the sun was high in the sky at the time that this business was officially initiated. And I had a uh, great success with this business. I, I did things. I was a pioneer of sorts, not in just a, in the area of fitness because I was kind of late to the game, but a pioneer in how I operated my business. Um, people kind of thought within a box here and they still do. Um, there are things that um, I launched and started during the time when, when gym works was really rolling. Nobody's done it yet. They've, they, they still haven't um, duplicated it, but guess what? All seasons come to an end. All seasons come to an end. And um, that happened with Gym Works. What's interesting about this series of eclipses is that um, later this year, 2004, there would be a um, solar eclipse at 21 degrees of Libra. But more importantly, the following April of 2005, there would be a uh, solar eclipse, total solar eclipse at 19 of Aries. And as I look back, what that was doing was it was closing out the first 20 something years of my life. And it was opening up the doorway officially to this sun sign that was at 18 degrees of Aries when I filed the DBA. That eclipse in April of 2005 opened the doorway to this new life that was coming. And I mean, it was, it was an adventure. Okay. So the, the business first began to fail in 2011, 2011, um, I don't remember. I know Pluto was then in, uh, it was kind of like the earlier stages of Pluto's transit through Capricorn. Um, yeah, Pluto was at seven. I'm trying to think what wall was going on. Oh, Ar Aranis had entered, uh, the 10th house. And I don't know what aspects it was forming, but we do know something suddenly happens when Uranus makes um, an ingress or it can suddenly happen. And that's what happened with me in, in the career. And so long story short, because I'm stubborn, it took a long time to realize that it was um, the business was dead. It was dead. And why it was so hard to let go of is because the only job security I've ever had in life 
is when I work for myself. The only times I've ever felt fulfilled in working is when I've been an entrepreneur, entrepreneur and working for myself, because there, that's how I could ensure that I would do something that I love doing, um, that I could be the, the author of my destiny, the captain of my ship, um, that I could not, I didn't have to worry about anyone limiting me. Well, if you be a good boy for three years and you maybe can, you can advance to being, um, manager and, and a higher paid yes, man. And then if you keep going, you know, I, that's not for me. It's not for me. Um, and so the only security I ever had is working for myself. And so when that, the signs were that, that was going away, it was like my world came crashing down. Um, and so, um, it took a long, it was a lot of depression. A lot of depression came out of that a lot. Um, and I, I, I did go back to school, um, finished my degree, earned my, 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 uh, undergrad in, um, journalism, which is what I started out with. So I wanted to finish what I started and I went and tried to work for people and it would be okay for a little while, but I hated it. I hated working for people. And so when I stumbled into astrology, it was because all those things that had gone on, all those calamities in life kind of led me into deeper into metaphysics and, and studying religion and esotericism and, and numerology and um, Kabbalah and astrology. And the astrology wasn't big on my radar, but it started growing on me because the thing of, of uh, the archetypal energy was lining up with what I was studying with mythology and, and just metaphysics. And, and so by me having a metaphysical side first, I was, and, and just life lessons getting my ass kicked, it, 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 it propelled my studies in astrology, you know? Um, and so if you're watching this and like, Oh my God, I don't want to hear him talking about himself. Well, the point of this is to try to demonstrate that the way you learn astrology first and foremost is by your own shit. That's how you learn it. You I'm, I'm thankful to have lived long enough to have enough transits to go back to reflect on. I've lived thankfully past the Saturn return, the first Saturn return. I've lived through the technical midlife crisis uh, stages where we have Neptune square, Neptune, Pluto square, Pluto, uh, Uranus opposite natal Uranus. Um, which are the three biggies of the midlife crisis. I'm thankful I've lived through that. I've got these experiences to, to recall. And that helps me with my clients because I'm, I've always was the, the runt growing up where I was normally the, the youngest one in the group, but now kind of long in the tooth. I'm, I'm talking to a lot of people who are a lot younger than me these days and some who are a lot older, but I have enough life experience to reflect on, to have something to offer literally clients from 18 to 80. Cause that's what my clientele spans that wide range. And so that's why I'm telling you all of this. When you can look back and reflect, that's the best way to study astrology is reflection. You study it best through your rearview mirror. You know, as much as we're told, don't look back, don't, well, is there something good sometimes about looking back, not looking back with regret, but looking back with 
curious, childlike learning eyes. So I'm going back and looking and I'm like, wow. So in April of next year, 2024, we have that solar eclipse happens. Total eclipse happens again at 19 degrees of Aries. So now my, the spidey senses are going. So that eclipse was opening up that, that particular chapter of life. And this upcoming eclipse, one way I see it for me is it is closing officially that chapter of my life. But because energy does not, it cannot be destroyed. It can neither be created nor destroyed. Then basically what's going on is I'm eclipsing the identity that I had associated with the, the, the root energy, the root energy that makes me up is a desire for learning, a desire to be great, a desire to help other people be great, a desire for transformation, um, a natural desire to teach a natural desire to help people become the best version of themselves. That's what made me so, so successful in gym works. That does not die. That is the energy that moves on from the past, uh, uh, space and time, 204 to 220 to 224 that will be carried on into this new who knows what is to come. That's what I'm titling this new phase, this, this, this brave new world, this, the, the next horizon, the, the, the whatever. But I, what I don't, I don't know for sure what the future holds. I can look at the weather. That's what we're doing when we when we when we do forecasts, we're looking basically we're reading the cosmic weather. But what I know, excuse me, what I know for sure is what I'm bringing from the past era into this new one. And it is those intangibles. And that helps us not fear. The eclipse seasons, because. Things end that are impermanent. But permanent things never end. Impermanent things end. But permanent things never end. The essence, the true, the true core is what never goes away. And knowing that we should be celebratory of the window that we're moving through. Because to remain in the past, to remain stagnant is to die. I have another great book, Water Pure and Simple, and it says water can always clean itself up if it moves. It is when water becomes stagnant that it becomes toxic. So the fact that cycles come in and they end, and then a new one starts, is actually what keeps the life force moving. Final thing, and I hope I haven't just bored y'all to death. Not a lot of astrological talk, but um, more philosophical, but it is what it is. Um, I want to read from, again, from... Dane Rudyard's an astrological mandala. And I'll um let's take this down. Okay. And so I'm gonna read um about five degrees. Let me mark this page too. Regarding the upcoming lunar eclipse. Again, at five degrees of Taurus. 
which I never pulled up the chart. I'll come back. We'll do another discussion about the, the energies. But um, five degrees of Taurus, a widow at an open grave. The impermanence of all material and social bonds. That, that just lines right up with what we were just talking about. All natural compounds decay, said the Buddha. The most beautiful and most enjoyed substance loses its potential energy through continuous actualization and the principle of integration and form is withdrawn, leaving the void, the open grave that ends all attachments. The void is the great challenge. What next? One must begin anew and if possible at a higher i.e. more inclusive and universal, less egocentric level. He, can, he further uh, says the fifth conclusive stage of the sequence, which deals with root elements and basic actions and responses may seem negative, yet it opens the door, opens the door to self-renewal. Beyond the personal attachment rises the possibility of participating in a larger sphere of existence. This possibility rarely manifests itself except as one is ready to discard the past. It, it lines right up. So when I read this, this triggered in my mind that word, the void, the void. And I'm not, what I'm going to say now is not, to be religious because I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't do the whole religious thing. My thing is we're talking about um, esoteric symbolism and studies of religious texts without having to be indoctrinated by the dogma of a particular religion. So I'm going to refer to the Christian Bible and the fact that the mothers of many of the great prophets and, and great characters in this book just so happen to be, have a phase where they are barren. And if we think about the word barren, it coincides with the word void. There's an emptiness. If the womb is barren, there's an emptiness. They, they, are, they are not with child and they don't seem capable to have a child. Now, Sarah, the mother of Isaac, barren womb. Rebecca, the mother of Jacob. And Jacob is supposed to be the father of, well, he's, he is Israel. He's the, he's the father of the 12 tribes, okay? Samson's mother, her name is not listed. Elizabeth, which is the mother of John, which is supposed to be the forerunner of the Christ. Then you have the mother of the Christ, she was born from, according to the mythology, she's born from an immaculate conception to a mother who was previously barren. When we go to Kabbalah, the tree of life here, the third sphere is called Bana. And if you'll notice, Saturn, okay, I got to make sure I get this one zoomed in. Sa Saturn is the sign or the planet associated with this third sphere. These are called the, the um, supernals, okay? These three, top three of the tree, okay? The word understanding is associated with it, but also in other versions of the tree, we have ama. And Amma means, refers to the barren mother. Now, if you think about Saturn, the time of year that it rules or the signs it rules and the, and the time of year associated with those signs, it is when the earth is, appears to be barren. The earth has withdrawn, cold, not producing life, not producing vegetation. 
okay? Even the word Amma that's associated, you know, the barren mother Amma. Just look, look, let's look at that word. How, what our mouth has to do to form it. Um, ma. See, these are, uh, what this sound, um, it's called a bilabial. Um, ab. Uh, that's why some of the first words are mama, baba. They're bilabials because this is from the baby suckling the mother's breasts. And when the baby latches on to the breast, it will say, um, and then when it releases, nah, um, nah. So even in the word ama, we have the initiation and the release. We have the life and death uh, scenario or the life and death phenomenon at play, even in the attachment to the breast and the release. Um, ma. Um, ma. This barren concept is preparation. There must be a void and emptying before there can be reception. The vessel must be prepared to receive. So, There's a lot of fear being pushed right now in the world. Ultimately, this is how I look at it. Have you been doing the work? What type of work have you been putting in? Have you been toiling? Maybe, just maybe, possibly. This is a window that is opening up for reception. And especially as we go through November where the, the intensity just keeps picking up and picking up and picking up. October has been an intense month. November, the intensity continues, especially culminating on the 12th where we'll have Mars, oppo uh, Mars opposing Uranus, which is going to be the closing square. The, uh, no, no, no. They're in opposition. I'm sorry. They're in opposition. I'm, I'm going too far. Uh, about to say closing square, but I misspoke. This will be the opposition point where things can suddenly break, where there can be catastrophe. So in the midst of the world where all this is going on and there's all this talk about war and this and that, what's going on in your world? What work have you been putting in? Because be mindful that Saturn is in Pisces. And while Saturn in Pisces can promote a lot of fear, it also can be magical. I'm coming back with a video about that. Magical. What would you imagine to exist in your reality? That juxtaposed to what work have you been putting in? I'm expecting some miracles personally. So I've been putting in the work, been putting in the work. As always, I'm available for private consultation through my website. 720astrology.com Know the stars to know yourself. Peace.